This will be a little different than other ones because they gave me a lot of time for this class, which is great because I normally get like three hours to try to do all of this. So we're going to have not only all the information that I can, that I have, the time will allot for today in this, but also I've set aside a little bit of time to uh, talk about what's going on with scan tool validation and NASTF and secure gateways and all of those things because I anticipated somebody would bring a box of uh, tomatoes to throw. I know almost every one of you that are in here, so let's talk about it. Let's have the, the, the discussion. General Motors didn't invent a mobilizer and neither did Ford or Chrysler or any of those. They went to Continental or Visteon or one other of those other companies that started a mobilizer systems and adopted those systems and components into it. We can totally nerd out on it, but we need to use something that's practical. If you tell them that with OEM tools and equipment, you don't have to pull any modules out, you can just do it in a couple minutes with a button push. They'll be like, yeah, but the tool's like $9,000. And that's the number I kept hearing. I'm like, that's an extra zero, so we're clear. The software is $900 for a year of unlimited use. And the tool's like 2,500 bucks So for the, for the factory interface. But most of you probably have a piece of equipment or tool in your shop or attached to a scan tool that you use daily that would work as the interface for that software. And it can be purchased on a shorter term. Up that game of how can we accurately diagnose and mobilize our systems. It doesn't take much. If you decide you're not going to do the cutting part and you don't want to get into all that, it can become a very inexpensive game to just add accurate diagnosis of immobilizers to your already probably wide repertoire of what you do. Right? It doesn't take a lot to be able to test if a key functions or not. And then along with how does the rest of the system work, we can pretty easily diagnose just about any immobilizer system. And then you go, all right, now not only can I fix them, and I found out I have all the tools to program them, or I have access to the tools and software to do it, now we can add in a value-added service. Those components, as I just talked about, are gonna power that transponder up. We have three domestic examples of them here. There is not a line in the sand with exception of, I think Grand Theft Auto is like the one that, I think if you stole cars in the past, it's gonna be really hard for anyone to trust you to not steal cars. So the answer on that is why? Why is NASTIF making that decision not to allow those people, right? Who, who are they to make that decision, right? That's my, that's my unbiased, that's my Keith Perkins prior to being on the board was I, I was a bit of a, a opponent of NASTIF. I was, a, I was a, kind of had a lot of harsh questions. As a matter of fact, if you go back and look, if you'd search on diag.net for my name and Donnie's name and look at some of our conversations, I had pointed questions, not accusatory, but I said, I have some questions. I have the same questions other people had. Why is it this way? And a big part of that is NASTIF is going to be liable for those individuals. So NASTIF is going to get sued because they gave you access to that cut code. So NASTIF's insurance says you can't insure people that are known to steal cars for giving data that could be used to steal cars, right? It's not NASTIF going, we're the key holders. It's more like, we would also like to not be sued and continue to do this. FDRS changed software, and then SPS changed, SPS went to SPS2, right? Um, talking to GM, there was no plan to go to SPS2. SPS1 was supposed to be it forever. It's a Java-based application that's on the internet. Why change that? We can add server space all the time. Why changing it was because the servers that are used to that architecture of Windows, Windows NT architecture that's been used since Windows 95. After Windows 3.1, they went to an NT architecture on the back end. It's still Unix-based. I'm a nerd. I went to school for internet network security. I used to work for the federal government doing cybersecurity. And I can tell you that the architecture used hasn't changed much on the back end. Windows 11 is a different architecture. Windows 11 is a different architecture because insurance companies dictated we had to change security architecture. Okay, so because of that, that's why all of those softwares are changing. That's why GM changed and everyone else. They had to, they were forced to. Jaguar Land Rover was eventually forced to, and they weren't, a for, they weren't first forced to by their insurance company in, in Europe where they're, where they're based. They were forced to by NASTIF's insurance company because our publicly facing server that their trust site hit was gonna cost us triple the amount of insurance. It's gonna cost NASTIF triple the amount of insurance just to own that server because it was insecure compared to what the, the industry standard of security is. I, I think a lot of people underestimate what it costs to run a technology company that interfaces with every OEM. So recently, Toyota Motor North America requested that Autel remove all keys lost security capabilities for Toyota vehicle brands from our tools. 
asserting that, the, that such functionality goes beyond what is permitted in the license agreement for the software we purchase. What they're saying is that they're part of ETI. So Autel sets on ETI just like Toyota does. And ETI is the Equipment and Tool Institute. And that is the, the group that's the table that you come and Snap-on sets down and Autel sets down and Toyota sets down and GM sets down. It's just, we're all gonna agree that you're not gonna steal anything from him and they're not gonna steal anything from you and they're not gonna sue you and you're not gonna sue them and da 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 da, da. And you know, everyone's got like all their fingers crossed the whole time they're talking, I guarantee toes and everything. But ETI sets down and says, okay, you're gonna join ETI, Autel and Snap-on. And because of that, Ford said, they're gonna give you all of their routines and software for their scan tools, because Ford does that. Ford gives everything for free to any ETI member. So anyone that's got 9,800 bucks in here today, you can sign up to be an ETI member as a scan tool manufacturer. You can sign, as long as you sell less than $10 million worth of tools a year, gross sales, you can sign up to be an ETI member. And if you do that, Part of that is Ford is one of the most gracious. They literally will give you all of their non-immobilizer routines for free. The immobilizer ones are gonna cost you. You have to pay to add parameter reset to your tool, the legitimate version, right? And so Brian was up there earlier and he said that about Snap-on, that you know, they, they're doing it legitimately. They paid for that parameter reset to be in the Snap-on tool. So GM charges $50,000 a year for General Motors stuff. Each manufacturer charges fees to put to license software. That's what that is. The reason why I stopped here is because I want you to know that Autel pays money to all the manufacturers to license their software. And if you think, oh, they stole everything, this is an email that says, Toyota says that the software we pay for didn't include this one thing. So Toyota is saying they're paying for it. So anyone's like, I don't, they steal everything. No, they're setting on ETI. They pay a lot of money. They pay, they pay a lot of money are probably one of the purchasers that purchased some of the most. Autel sells a ton of tools. So Autel has an agreement with Toyota and Toyota says that their, their agreement doesn't include all keys lost. That's what that first paragraph says. So we believe and have responded that security functions fall under the terms performing diagnosis analysis test and repair of a vehicle in the license and therefore should be allowed. So somewhere in that agreement, the term performing diagnosis analysis test and repair of the vehicle is in their agreement. And they're saying all keys lost is part of that. I do agree that learning a key to a car or all the keys have been lost is part of the repair of a vehicle. Does anyone disagree? Cool, we're good. So carrying on basically, this, the, the rest of this thing just says, Toyota says that we're not supposed to do this. We think that we are, but in good faith, we're gonna take it out of the tool until basically I think it's, oh crap, they might be right. We better go talk to our lawyers. So until then, we're gonna pull it out so we don't get sued, right? It would be terrible to lose the whole agreement. So at least take all keys lost out, or, or we cannot take all keys lost out, and then in six months, we have to remove all of Toyota from our tool altogether because we violated this license agreement we said we wouldn't violate, right? I want you guys, I'm presenting it this way because I want everyone to, to stop their freak out, their internal, oh, they're just doing X, Y, Z, I want you to realize they're probably being pretty reasonable. Autel's going, we'd rather not lose everything. Let's see what we can do to work it on the back end. I need everyone to realize NASTIF is not the federal government. We are an organization. Dude. So the alternative right now is nothing. Exactly. Right? So legitimately, I'm telling you right now, if you would like to change that, you can start your own organization. That's what NASTIF, that's how NASTIF started. NASTIF was all these other organizations, like for instance, let's just take Auto Care Association. Everyone know who they are? They put on Seaman Apex every year. They, they, they do a lot of things. That's where you see a lot of the right to repair stuff right now is Auto Care. Auto Care, if they felt like it was within something they wanted to do, today could be like, hey, we'd like to take all of that over from NASTIF. And they would just need to go to, and you would just need to set up an organization. I'm not being facetious about this. I understand no one person is going to have the money, finances to do this. You would need backers and all that. But this is, I want you to realize what NASTIF is and what it isn't. NASTIF is not something that was designated as the monopoly and the fool. You're the only one that does that. Anyone else is welcome to start an organization and go do this and go get those agreements with each manufacturer. And I, I, the reason I say it this way is because I want you to realize that NASTIF didn't take anything and go, this is us. They put in blood, sweat, and tears to write all these agreements and go to Ford and go, hey, Ford, we would really like to get all of our aftermarket technicians' capability to do this. What will it take 
for you to let us do the same thing your dealers do because there's no laws that say they have to do that, just so we're clear. So they said, it's this, this, and this. And they sat down for months and years and worked out a deal. And then they worked out a, the same deal with every single manufacturer. You guys all got time to do that, right? You got the money, resources, and everything. No, it's like, it's exhausting. The amount of time that I spend reading through agreements and stuff and going over it with Nastif and coming up with solutions to talk with manufacturers to make sure that I get the same thing they get, Nissan, Mercedes, and Hyundai, Kia, and Genesis, who are not complying with any of the laws, or, or I say laws, with any of the memorandums of understanding and agreements we have. So we assigned this agreement. Now you, you broke that agreement, your right. Nissan, right? And I'm Nastif. What power do I have now? I'm Nastif. What do you guys perceive that Nastif has power-wise that we should be doing? Litigation. Litigation. That's all we have. We're not a government entity. I can't Nastif can't levy a fine. I can't, I can't make anyone do anything. Nastif, we don't have, we're, not a, we're not a government entity. We don't have, we're a not-for-profit not organization. We're backed by our biggest power is the fact that we have all you guys that we get to go, hey, all these people want this. Please give it to us, right? So we have to go to the federal government and go, hey, they broke this law and we need to sign. And then nobody wants to, we have to go through arbitration first because in those agreements, it's not just, we just get to go get a lawyer. There's this thing called a dispute resolution panel. It's an arbitration process, okay? So that process looks like this. Any individual NASTF member that files an SIR, okay? I'm looking at every one of you that files an SIR because you didn't get something, I wish I had a mirror to look at myself, that wishes that you, that you, got, that you didn't get something you were supposed to get, you get to file an SIR with NASTF. NASTF will go, okay, we t we're gonna take your complaint that to us. NASTF doesn't, Got to think, all the guys at Nastif, they don't all work on all the same cars we work on. Because Honda has an, has an idea in their mind that if they manufacture a car and they sell it to a ton of people and then they make it to where it could get fixed anywhere, that they'll probably keep selling Hondas. Nissan has the same thought process, but then they don't fall through with it, so now they have 43% less sales than they did last year. Weird correlation that Keith made. Wonder if somebody else could, at their corporate level could probably think about that. Like, I, I'm, willing, I'm, I'm here literally willing to take hard questions about this NASTIF thing. You'll see that there is a logo on them. So what does this logo mean? Hit it with a wrench. Hit it with a wrench. <laughs> <laughs> Means the transmission needs rebuilt after we install it. No. no. So for those of you that haven't ever seen this before, this is supposed to be a CRT monitor, okay? And this is software going in and out and a wrench. So what I used to say that we were talking about was I always said this meant that that component needed programmed, right? Mm -hmm. It means it may need programmed. Because for the longest time I said that, I told everyone, if anyone has had a programming class of mine years ago, I said, that means it needs programmed. I have to take that back. You don't know what you don't know, right? There's a point in time where this was always correct and then something changed. So I had a 20, like 18 Equinox or something that we put a passenger side window switch in. Had this logo on it, Ben. Yeah. It, and so I'm like, okay, it needs to be programmed. We go look up the service information. It says nothing about programming on doing it. And it worked out of the box. And I was like, well, that's weird. Because the base software that was in that window switch would operate in Equinox without the automatic windows and pinch sensor and stuff. But when installed into a Cadillac, it needed a revision from the base software to something that would run the rest of those window switches. I can find anything. Best part about knowing is knowing where to find out or who to call. What thought process was there like, we built 20,000 cars and I put the same password on all of them. Nobody will ever find out. You don't think like a dealer tech like got the pen for one and put it in and then the next car he was like, that's the same pen. That's weird. I don't, I don't know how long they thought that was gonna stay under wrap. Uh, a lot of Subarus, a lot of the, the remote learning functions are inside the remotes. Again, I just wanna point out the weird anomalies from what you would normally expect. Most of these other cars, you just put in the pen you bought from the manufacturer. But they do have uh, pin and cut codes are 995 for the older systems. The OTPW code generations are 40 bucks. If it's an all keys lost, typically the cluster, using OEM methods, the cluster needs to be EEPROM'd beyond that. And unfortunately, Subaru for their OEM tool doesn't offer a short-term subscription, so you're at 35 bucks for, the, for an annual subscription for Subaru. I'm in Oklahoma, I don't work on nearly as many Subarus as I used to. 
I lived in Colorado, I probably would have been able to justify that at this point. Now, having the Subaru tool alone at the shop is a total loss leader for us. I don't do, I don't do $3,500 worth of programming on Subaru a year, but I also can't fathom saying no to any of my customers on a Subaru. If they call me for a McLaren, I could be like, yeah, I don't want to do it. I, I just, I, I'm not going to invest in that for the one every four years that I get asked about. I'll just send it to Mario and make sure you get tools and equipment that's going to be beneficial for you. Don't spend a bunch of money on it and then not get any ROI because it, it'll, it'll turn, totally turn you away. Also remember that not every immobilizer solution is through the OBD2 port. You may have to go as far as like EEPROM. And if you have to go that far and you don't want to get into it, don't. It's not always worth it. You've got to make enough off of it for it to be worth it. Don't just fall with the trend. Don't try to be cool like Mario. Just, it's okay. Not everyone has to do that. I, got, I had to get you one more time. So take that email down. I check my emails every single night. Um, when I'm at training events, I, I'm a couple days behind on answering them, but if you've got any problem or something, give me a shout. Want to know about a tool or whatever, I can at least direct you in the right direction. Okay, so everyone, thank you guys. I held you over a little bit, but uh, you should be good to go. Somebody take, take a survey.